So we've looked at what the minimal separation for FSK is, and we saw how we could use the assumption of Nyquist pulses to determine a calculation for the spectral efficiency of FSK. So now I'm going to look at the spectral efficiency of MPSK, but before I go to the m case, I'm going to go via the binary and quaternary case to develop an intuition, and then I'll go through the same types of calculations that we did previously with FSK. So let's start with binary phase shift keying. Uh, in this case, um, I'm going to start by showing you um, this uh, sketch of the time domain, and t is the time of a bit. And this is just a sketch where it's easy to see what the bits are doing. But really, it's really going to be a sync in time domain. I just wrote it like these rectangles just to make it easier for you to visualize what I'm constants I'm talking about. But I want to put the caveat right up front that when I do my calculation for what the occupied bandwidth is, I'm going to assume that it's not square in the rectangle. Uh, rectangular in the time domain, but really rectangular frequency domain. So, with that caveat, let's suppose that we have binary data and that during the time of a single bit, uh, we send a, a data bit, d0, then d1, etc. So, if I am using a sync in the, uh, so first of all, the data rate is 1 over t, so the bit rate, there's your bit rate. And what is the occupied bandwidth? So again, um, assuming that you know I have this assumption that it's a sync in the time domain, that, that assumption, that means that the occupied bandwidth, the minimum possible occupied bandwidth for this data rate is uh, 1 over t. So you know we showed this uh, calculation previously um, with each of the FSKs. You know, the smallest that could be is 1 over t. Um, so this is BPSK. So now, what happens if I look at QPSK? First of all, I'm going to say that the bit rate is the same. Once again, this T is the time of a bit. This is the binary little graph sketch here. And for QPSK, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take the same bit rate because during the time from 0 to 2T, two bit intervals, I'm going to take the first bit and send it in the in phase branch. Sorry, on the in phase branch, and the second bit I'm going to send in the quadrature branch. What does that mean? Well, remember for QPSK, for the in phase branch, I'm going to be multiplying by some cosine carrier frequency plus, you know, the appropriate phase for. Uh, whatever uh, symbol I'm sending. And here in the quadrature, well, I'm just going to do the sign, same carrier frequency, and of course, whatever is the appropriate angle for the data bits I happen to be sending. So I'm having an in phase and a quadrature. I'm using a cosine and a sine. For BPSK, I was just using cosine. I was only using the in phase. I just wasn't using the other one. So what does this mean in terms of our spectral occupancy and our data rate? Well, let's think about the signal that's going through the in-phase branch, or the in-phase signal. That data rate, well, I'm sending one bit in the time of two bit intervals. I'm sending d0 and 2tb. So if I looked at the data rate of just the information in the in-phase branch, it would be 1 over 2t. And if I assume that I'm using not these square pulses you see in the sketch, but if I'm using the most spectrally efficient pulse I can, that means that the bandwidth I could occupy and for that in-phase uh, signal would be um, 1 over uh, 2TB. So what's going on in the quadrature branch? Well, of course, exactly the same thing because everything is nice and symmetrical. The bit rate going on in the quadrature branch is 1 over TB, just like before, and the bandwidth also 1 over uh, 2 TB. Great, great. 
So this is each one of the branches separately. Now I ask you the question, what's going on for the QPSK totally? Well, if I look at QPSK, you might ask, well, the data rate, well, clearly the data rate is 1 over t, because in one branch I'm sending one bit, in the other branch I'm sending another bit, so I've got two bits in the time of two bit intervals. So the bit rate is 1 over t, which means that I take these two and I add them to get this one. But now I'm going to ask you the question, what goes on with the bandwidth? What is the occupied bandwidth for the QPSK signal? And to answer that question, you have to look back and think about what's going on here in the in-phase and quadrature. Because they both have the same carrier frequency. I have a cosine omega CT, I have a sine omega CT, and they have the exact same carrier frequency. They're superimposed on top of one another. I can tell them apart because cosine and sine are orthogonal. That's not a problem. But they're not side by side. FSK, they were side by side. That's not what's going on with PSK. They're superimposed. There's only one frequency, the center frequency for both the in-phase and the quadrature, which means that when I look at what is the occupied bandwidth, it's not the sum of the two, like it was the sum of the two for the data rate. Instead, it's just uh, one of them uh, because they're each superimposed. So the bandwidth of QPSK totally is 1 over the time of a bit, 1 over 2 time, uh, time of a bit. So this means that QPSK is twice as spectrally efficient. It takes up half the spectrum as BPSK. And what's interesting is that if we look at the performance, the probability of error for, um, excuse me, uh, BP, uh, BPSK and QPSK is very similar, that the uh, QPSK is just this factor of two, very small difference with BPSK. Now, there are differences perhaps in complexity. Maybe QPSK takes a bit more of equipment than BPSK, but in general, this twice as spectrally efficient is a huge gain. And so we uh, often see QPSK as the modulation of choice uh, compared to BPSK in any case. <coughs> so now we can uh, go to our definition of spectral efficiency and calculate for BPSK and QPSK. What is the spectral efficiency? In the case of BPSK, very simple. It's one bit per second per hertz. And in the case of QPSK, it's just twice that, two bits per second per hertz. Now, as I uh, go up to MRE signaling, what's going to happen? Well, of course, my argument about sine and cosine, it certainly applies as I branch up to MPSK. Uh, there's just the two branches in the receiver, one cosine, one sine. Bandwidth is always superimposed as one carrier frequency. Now, the time of a symbol, suppose I fix the, the, baud, the bit rate, so the time of a bit is fixed. The time of a symbol, as I add more constellation points, it's getting longer and longer. So the time of the symbol getting longer as m gets larger, which of course means that the bandwidth it occupied is getting smaller. So, very straightforward application of the uh, bandwidth equation, and we come up that with um, uh, MPSK, the efficiency is just log 2m bits per second per hertz, because the bandwidth, the bandwidth always goes with the uh, symbol rate. So the bandwidth is always 1 over the uh, time of the symbol. And because of this, it's 1 over the time of bit, log 2m. And when I plug it into my um, spectral efficiency, I get log 2m bits per second per hertz uh, for the spectral efficiency of mpsk. So if we were trying to sketch this out, what happens? Uh, again, I'm going to assume that the uh, bit rate is fixed. I'm sending 1 kilobit per second all the time. I use BPSK, it's taking up a kilohertz to send that one kilobit per second. And if I use QPSK, if now I use two branches, I use a cosine and a sine, well then I can have the um, frequency that's occupied. And so my um, uh, spectral efficiency is uh, two bits per second per hertz. And suppose I use 8PSK, 
Well, 8 PSK, you know, look what's going on here, uh, maybe in the time domain to get a little intuition for it. Here it was, the time of a bit is, a, excuse me, is fixed. But the time of a symbol is getting larger, you know, so there's no change um, for a, a longer time, whereas here we see transitions that are quick for BPSK. The transitions, they can only happen half as much, which means because it's slower, bandwidth is smaller. So you can see the same here. I have a symbol, 110, three bits per symbol. But suppose um, uh, I send, you know, I have like eight different um, uh, phases, and I just send one phase during that time. So the time of those three bits, I send one phase. That's the time of a symbol. And so my occupied bandwidth is much lower. And the case here is one third reduced by a third with three bits per second. So that's half the story. I have the spectral efficiency given by this equation. But of course, the other half of the story is the error probability. And the error probability um, does take a big hit uh, as m gets bigger. So I'm getting more spectrally efficient, but less power efficient as I scale m up. So the equation for the probability of error is there. And of course, we can see in this equation the directly where's the QPSK. So as we discussed before, it's very easy to identify what is the loss compared to QPSK. And now we can start doing some numerical comparisons, quantitative comparisons of spectral efficiency versus power efficiency. So let's take, for instance, uh, 8 PSK. I can get the efficiency up to 3 bits per second per hertz. But if I look at the loss compared to QPSK, I'm looking at 3.58 dB. If I go to m equals 16, of course, I get another bit per second per hertz in efficiency, but I'm taking a hit in terms of the power required to get there. I, you know, I need um, a five, almost four and a half dB more uh, power in order to uh, achieve the same performance. But quantitative, I said from the day one, these things have to be traded off. Now we're getting the tools to be able to do that trade off quantitatively. Uh, so we saw previously the same um, illustration for um, fixed bit rate. Uh, you could do another comparison with fixed uh, baud rate. So I'll call it fixed baud rate. Baud rate is just another way to say symbol rate. So here I had the time of a symbol fixed. Now here I'm going to have the time, uh, time of bit fixed here, fixed bit rate. And now I'm going to do the time of a symbol um, fixed. And of course, remember that the occupied bandwidth is just 1 over the time of a symbol, if I assume Nyquist's uh, signaling. So that's the same as saying I have fixed bandwidth. Okay. So if I have fixed bandwidth, so what can I do is I scale m. So my bandwidth is fixed, but which means the time of a symbol is fixed. So it used to be, you know, I had one bit per symbol. Now in the same slot that I used to send just one bit, now I'm sending uh, with QPSK. Oops, I'm gonna let this work. Two bits in the same time slot, and if I go to QPSK, I'm sending three bits in one time slot, and so. The time slot is fixed, the bandwidth is fixed, but the amount of information I'm sending is changing. So that's two sides of the spectral efficiency. Either I send data at the same rate and I can be more spectrally efficient by using less spectrum, or I fix the number of spectrum, uh, the amount of spectrum, and as I increase M, I'm just sending faster and faster data rates. So I've shown you previously these comparisons of the bit error rates for FSK and PSK, FSK being orthogonal frequencies. And I start at binary. And then as M gets bigger, I'm getting um, you know, better performance. So M gets bigger, bit error rate gets better. But while well, the um, um, Bit rate is increasing, it's true, 
are also seeing an increase in bandwidth. And we saw that uh, it was a significant increase in bandwidth. For MPSK, of course, we saw these curves, and it's non orthogonal, non orthogonal frequent uh, modulation. And as M gets bigger, we can see that our bit error rate is getting worse. So the uh, bandwidth is constant, perhaps, but the bit rate is increasing, but the performance is getting worse. So one set of curves is not enough to tell the whole story. One point, just the bit error rate versus SMR is not enough to tell the whole story about which, constel uh, which modulation format would be best. You have to also take into account the spectral efficiency, which isn't seen in these curves. So this is a table which gives you another way of representing this trade-off of um, the two points, power efficiency and spectral efficiency. So in particular, in this table, we again, we fix the bit rate, 9,600 bits per second, and we examine two kinds of modulation, MPSK, MFSK, non-orthogonal MFSK, and of course, these are going to occupy different bandwidths because as we, um, um, especially as we increase uh, M. But uh, already for the same data rate, MPSK is already um, more um, bandwidth efficient to start with than uh, an FSK. So now uh, we'll go on and look at, we'll set a certain quality of signal. So I'm not going to say um, the whole curve. I'm going to say I'm interested in one point in the bit error rate curve. I'm interested in the point where I achieve bit error rate of 10 to the minus 5. I know if I get 10 to the minus 5, I won't have any calls, complaints from my cellular clients saying the quality is bad of their signal. If they get 10 to the minus 5, they'll be happy. So um, fixing that, I say for each modulation format, what does it require in EB over N0 and signal to noise ratio in order for me to achieve uh, this performance quality that I want? So that's those columns. And then uh, finally, let's look at what happens as M varies. Well, if we look at the two spectral efficiencies, spectral efficiency of PSK and FSK, um, of course, spectral efficiency is going up for MPSK as we get M, a larger constellation, and the exact opposite is happening for FSK. So the, the bit rate is fixed, so I'm occupying more and more bandwidth, so my um, efficiency is going down as M gets bigger. Um, then we could look at the performance in terms of, like, the performance is fixed, bit error rate is fixed, so I look at, like, how much power do I need in order to achieve that performance? And I can see here that um, uh, even at uh, binary, I don't need as much EB over N0 as FSK to start with, but as I increase the number of points in the constellation, I'm requiring much more EB over N0 for a PSK, whereas the exact opposite is having an FSK, it's getting uh, easier and easier to receive it. I need less and less power to achieve the same quality of service. So we can see very different behaviors going on here that uh, the growth of the constellation achieves very different goals for these two modulation formats. Uh, and so that makes us think about what would be situations where one would be preferable over another. So we call that um, um, uh, these two concepts of a power limited system versus a bandwidth limited system. Power limited system, you know, I, I, I make it obvious, right? It's a system with little power available. So maybe expand on that a little bit. What does that mean? EB over N0 isn't very big. <laughs> it's small. It's limited. Why is it limited? Well, it could be a couple of reasons. Let's give you an example. Deep space. There's nothing I can do to get more power. I can't put a bigger antenna on. You know, it's only so big antenna, a solar panel. Um, I can't big big antenna, get gain in my antenna. You know, I just have limited options. I can't put a bigger battery on there. It's just small and it's far and it's getting farther. So for sure, there's just not much power available. Another example, that could be something living off a battery. It could be an internet of things, something small, something deployed, and it's got a little battery and it's got to last a long time. So uh, many situations that could describe a power limited system. If I have a power-limited system, evidently MFSK looks like a good solution that I can get 
uh, more uh, higher and higher FSK levels. Now look at those two examples I just gave. Uh, in deep space probe, I'm probably willing to pay quite a bit. Uh, IFT, deployed sensor, probably want to keep those real cheap. So the solutions may be different, but they're both described as power limited systems. Now let's look at something else. Let's think about let's think about like um, deployed um, wire, twisted pair wire. You know, a telephone company paid a lot over 50 years, 100 years to deploy wires all over the city, and there's a pair of wires going into every home. So those pair of wires uh, provide me with a system I can exploit to send data, not just voice. But of course, there's just so much bandwidth available on that twisted pair. It's not the best uh, channel I could use. And so that's it. I'm not going to put another set of cables to the house. Maybe I want to just use the ones that are there. And that would be an example of a bandwidth limited system. Another one would be like a cellular system, maybe, um, or a system with wireless where you have a small, uh, limited amount of uh, regulated, permitted uh, bandwidth that you can exploit. In these situations, MPSK sounds like a good solution because it's very spectrally efficient. So let's compare spectral efficiency, power efficiency, two of the three pillars that we're interested in. And I've talked about FSK and PSK directly, and now I'm just going to throw at you that QAM, same spectral efficiency as PSK. Everything we did to describe PSK applies equally well as PAM. They both use in-phase and quadrature. They use a cosine of a carrier frequency, sine of a carrier frequency. One puts it on phase, the other one does a combination of amplitude and phase. So in terms of spectral efficiency, exact same calculation, exact same equation. Uh, but of course, what's very different is the performance of these. Oh, I understand. That was correct. This should be sine squared because I put it underneath the square root sign. Sorry about that. So uh, in any case, to get back to my point, um, the power efficiency is very different across these. And we had a little table that compared these two, but now I'd like to compare these two. Above all, because they have exactly the same spectral efficiency. So now we'll say, well, what do they look like in terms of their uh, power efficiency? And so here we see uh, different modulation formats, PSK and QAM. We have the spectral efficiency here, which is, of course, the same for both of them, when uh, 16 gives you 4 bits per second for both. But here we have the power efficiency, which we put in terms of loss uh, with respect to QPSK. So in other words, um, QPSK is zero loss compared to itself. 8 PSK, 3.6 dB loss. 16 PSK, 8.2 dB loss whereas 16 QAM has only 4 dB loss compared to QPSK. So right away, here we have an example, same spectral efficiency, but I notice here, <laughs> I need 4 dB less EB over N0 to get this, the same performance. So very nice um, uh, compared to PSK. So I said that there were power limited and band limited, Cellular is a really tough nut, a really tough problem because it's small, battery small, you want to keep it um, so there's not that much power, it's power limited. And of course you just pay enormous billions of dollars for the spectrum, so you want to keep them really spectrally efficient. So for sure we're going to go to QAM uh, when we look at cellular uh, modulation formats. So the table I could have presented instead in the form of bit error rate. And of course, you know, all of these curves, they're the classic waterfall curves. The shape just doesn't change much from one to the next. What's really important is the relative performance, where we position this curve compared to QPSK. That's why QPSK loss is such a great way of characterizing a signal. So for instance, before we said we had set PE equal 10 to the minus 5. So that was, in its essence, comparing these points on these curves. Well, it was for another set of curves, but still, you get the idea. Um, so we can see that DPSK, uh, differential phase shift keying, has you know, less than a dB loss compared to uh, BPSK. We can see that if we looked at these two curves, pretty similar, uh, but one of them only gives you three uh, bits per symbol. The other one gives you four bits per symbol, so for the same 
um, occupied bandwidth, you know, you can get much faster communications with another. So we can see here why uh, QAM would be preferred over PSK. Of course, uh, that was two pillars. We we're talking about the um, power efficiency, the spectral efficiency, but the third is cost. And certainly there are places where the PSK uh, cost could be more interesting uh, than the QAM cost. And so that's why so many modulation formats exist, so you can find the right uh, trade-off for all these factors. So I'll just end on sort of a historical note. Uh, I mentioned um, telephone lines. So we started out with the first time that telephone lines were being used to go from voice communications to data communications. Happened in the 60s and into the 80s. And you can see here we're limited, maxed out at something like 2.4 kilohertz of bandwidth that's available. And as we increased the uh, bit rate, the way that we achieved them is by going to higher and higher uh, modulation formats. And here we have the spectral efficiency that was uh, achieved uh, in those years. Uh, as we moved on into the, sort of the second wave of development of uh, communications uh, solutions, we started looking at higher efficiency solutions. We're looking at very, very high level QAM. We use uh, the trellis coded, we use coded modulation so that we could get error correcting codes to increase the performance. We sort of pushed out the um, um, covered spectral range by going out and improving the quality of the lines. Uh, but we certainly hit some maximum of what could be achieved in that. And so we'll get to, uh, is there some limit to how much information you can, uh, can, can uh, convey? And so that will be uh, the point of uh, the next lecture. Thank you.